uh, we got about 45 minute back walk to town, I would come on live and do a menopause Q&A because that's fun for me and show you guys the incredible scenery here and tell you right. Uh, so we have rental property here um, and we decided to stay here for most of the summer, escape the heat. I'm writing the new menopause book while we're here, get away from the routine, shut my clinic down. Um, so I could be able to do this. So if you have any questions, drop them in the comments below and I will to say that delivering babies and what I did for 25 years wasn't important. It was, but I feel like there was such a gap for our women in midlife for things focused on their care and how we could actually improve their health long term. Um, that I, hey Blake, sorry I'm saying hi to some of my best followers. Uh, so, okay. So everybody who's just joining, take your finger, tap my face like 10 times. That will drive the silly algorithm that rules all of our lives. These of us who are creators. So while I'm waiting for questions to drop, I spend all day, you know, educating, educating in clinic and educating to strangers on social media. And so I was hiking today and I heard some people talking about the hike we were going to go on. And I decided to jump in and like educate about the hike and how far and how long. And you know, when I'm not talking about menopause, not all of my education is appreciated. <laughs> so I need to learn how to keep my mouth shut <laughs> when it needs to be shut. Okay, so, okay, what is menopause? Um, menopause, our ovaries age twice as fast as the rest of our body. Um, and so females are born with all of their genetic material and uh, in their germ cells, their eggs, okay? And they deteriorate as we age. And so the menopause represents the end of sex hormone production from the ovaries, completely, none, okay? Less than 1% of reproductive years. So estrogen drops to nothing, progesterone drops to nothing. Testosterone drops about in half because half of our testosterone is made in the adrenal glands for women. Um, so we still have some, uh, but not as much as we used to. So we do make a little bit of estrogen from the peripheral conversion of uh, androgens to estrone in the, in the fat cells. Uh, and then that can be back converted to estradiol, but it's absolutely minimal. It could never, should never be considered to be enough um, to support your health during menopause. Now, I have seen some patients who were overdosed on testosterone, and it's way more common than you think. Um, a lot of the people who are being sold pellets are being brought to super physiologic ranges, actually male level ranges, and, um, and they do see some benefits from that, but the side effects are pretty, pretty rough. And one of the things we see is really high estrogen levels from that peripheral conversion. Um, so you have to be careful about that. So um, can you have estrogen without progesterone patch? Um, so if you don't have a uterus, you don't need progesterone to protect the lining of the uterus, okay? So uh, if you have a Mirena IUD without, or a progestin-containing IUD, you don't need extra progesterone to protect the lining of the uterus. Progesterone is sometimes given outside of estrogen to help with inducing a period, to help with sleep, to help with some anxiety. At night, it can be really helpful. Um, we use it for a lot of different reasons, endocrine reasons, in gynecology. But if you've had a hysterectomy, you don't need it for the endometrial protection. Um, let's see. Okay, your testosterone started working, but you quickly gain weight along with it. How high is your testosterone level? Remember, female physiologic ranges average at 45, and 70 is max, okay? A lot of people are being overdosed with testosterones in the hundreds, two, three, four. I've seen as high as 500 in a woman. And rapid weight gain, acne. These hormonal components cause strokes. So we know that women who suffer from premature ovarian failure. So they lose their 
hormones early, their estrogen early, have an increased risk of strokes. And it's kind of a continuum. The earlier you are, the longer you live without estrogen, the higher your risk of stroke. So that's probably the best way to think about it. The longer you live without estrogen, the high, nat, you know, your natural estrogen without being replaced, the higher your risk of cardiovascular disease. The longer you live without estrogen, the higher your risk of osteoporosis. The longer you live without estrogen, the higher your risk of vaginal atrophy. The longer you live without estrogen, the higher your risk of migraine headaches. The longer you live without estrogen, the higher your risk of Alzheimer's and dementia. All true. So um, it's not meant to scare you. I see some of the comments. This is meant to educate you. These are facts, not based in fear, okay? So you know about it. There's stuff you can do about it, ladies. How you show up in your perimenopause health-wise is how that's going to predict that your perimenopause and menopause go. So, um, so yeah, I am high. So everybody take a second, tap my face a bunch of times like this. That drives likes and that makes the algorithm bring more people my way. So you should take estrogen as long as the benefits outweigh the risks. Plain and simple. Once you are starting to feel what is, you know, once you start having signs of, of your estrogen, of your ovarian failure. This is ovarian failure, guys, okay? We're gonna call it what it is. Menopause is ovarian failure. And once you start having signs and symptoms, you sh as long as the benefits outweigh the risks, you should be on estrogen therapy so that you can live as long and as healthy as possible. So, um, there is no cutoff at 60. There's no cutoff. There's no absolute age cutoff. There is none. Okay, every year it's a redecision. Do the risks for me based on my age, my family history, my concomitant medical problems. Outweigh the benefits, yes or no. Keep going. In my clinic, I have patients in their 60s on hormone therapy because we have decided based on blood work, history, medical, complicate, whatever, that the benefits for them are outweighing the risks. You should no longer think of estrogen as a way to get rid of hot flashes. It is so, so much more than that, and it does more for your body. So, um, so... I take, so everybody drop in the comments, what are you using for hormone therapy if you're on it? So my preference is the estradiol patch. Uh, it costs me $5, $10 a month with my insurance. If you don't have insurance and shop around, like with GoodRx or my, Mark Cuban's pharmacy, you can get transdermal estradiol patches, generic, for, and I use the generic for $10, $15, $20, 30 maybe, okay? Oral micronized progesterone is also what I take. I still own my uterus. It's still inside of me. I need to protect the lining from endometrial hyperplasia. I do oral micronized progesterone, $5 a month. Okay. I also have sarcopenia. I was not gifted with a lot of muscle based on my genetics. And because of my quest to be skinny in my 20s and 30s and half of my 40s, my only goal was to be thin. I have ruined my body by lack of muscle mass. And now in my late 40s and 50s, it is a quest to put that muscle back on or at least hang on to what I've got. So I'm utilizing some testosterone, low dose, to help me with that. And I do that in a compounded cream. That's my most expensive HRT. And it runs me $30 a month. So those of you who are saying you can't afford hormone therapy, ask your physician why they are not giving you these options. Okay, and if they tell you this is all I order, Find a new provider. They need to educate themselves. You know, their job is not to enrich themselves by giving you pellets. Okay? Um, DHEA has not been proven to do much. It's, I do not prescribe it. It's not, it's not, it's over the counter, guys. It's a food substance, okay? DHEA is not regulated. And there is not nearly enough reasonable data in humans, human studies that show benefit to a menopausal woman, other than with some vaginal DHEA. Okay, and that is a prescription. It's called Interosa. That's different. But just to like buy a $150 bucks worth of DHEA oral pills, you don't know where that's been. You don't know how much DHEA is really in there. That shit hasn't been tested. Guys, be careful. You're being sold a bill of goods. DHEA has never been shown to improve the libido. Never.
There's not one study. Not one study, okay? Uh, there was some, oh, I'm lying. In the last century, there was a very small study done on the very elderly women. And uh, I'm talking in their 70s, 80s. And they gave DHEA too. And they saw some moderate improvements. So our DHEA levels actually don't really decline that much um, in menopause. <laughs> uh, so, you know, if you're in your 70s or 80s, sure, give it a whirl. See if it improves your libido. Um, but, you know, y'all are being sold a bill of goods. There is not enough data to support its use in humans. I'd love to see high quality randomized controlled studies on that. But until there is, I'm not gonna recommend you spend that much money. I'd rather just give you the testosterone, okay? If that's what you need. So, um, uh, let's see, when do you know you need hormone therapy? Drop your reply in the comments. I knew I needed it when I went from being a completely functional, top of the world, healthy, absolutely killing life, 30 something year old or 40, 40 something year old and the shit hit the fan. And yes, I'd had some life stuff going on, but I could, I, I lost all of my resilience. I wasn't sleeping. I was mad at the world. I was gaining weight in weird places. And the moment that I thought, is this all there is? I was an OB gen. I was too scared to take hormone therapy. I hadn't read the new studies. No one was putting them from American College of ob -GYN. No one was placing the new studies in front of me saying you need to read this to be able to take care of a menopausal woman. So um, I, I myself, I gaslit myself till I realized there's nothing wrong with me. I'm, but why can't, why am I not me? Why have I lost myself? You know, and that's when I knew, let's give hormones a try. And the hot flashes were the fucking worst. And then I couldn't sleep. And then when I don't sleep, nothing goes well in the world. So, um, okay. Uh, and that's how I knew. Let's see, because of you, you changed doctors. The old doctor told you you needed an antidepressant to solve your menopause symptoms. Yeah, good idea. If they're not willing to have a conversation, some women will need antidepressants. I am not knocking that, okay? I have patients on antidepressants, and we stay on them. Um, but you, it's not in place of hormone therapy. Never. Never, never, never. Uh, I'm reading the questions. Okay. The medroxyprogesterone acetate is the, was the link to what it slightly increased the cancer risk in the WHI. It was not the estrogen. Remember, the estrogen only arm saw a decreased risk of breast cancer. It was the estradiol, the estradiol sorry, Primarin, not even estradiol. It was the Primarin plus medroxyprogesterone acetate or Provera is the brand name for that. So that was called Primpro that had the increased risk. So it was the medroxyprogesterone acetate. I do not prescribe it. I do not give it. I never recommend it. I give oral micronized progesterone or a compi patch. The end. Okay. Um, compounded drugs are not better. They're just compounded. I use compounding from time to time, but don't feel like you're getting something superior. All of this information I've read and read, I've read. I'm curious when I read these things. I don't get on my high horse. I'm like, okay, maybe I'm missing something. I don't think I'm perfect. But doing all these saliva and urine tests and having these compounds compounded just for you, you're getting the same shit as the lady who just walked out behind you. I fucking promise. Okay? There's nothing magical about it. I use compounding when I don't have another option. When over the when the traditional remedies that are regulated aren't working for the patient, then we move on to compounding. It is never my first line if I can get around it. Okay? So don't feel like you absolutely have to do something compounded in order to get good quality, efficacious, safe hormone replacement therapy. You don't. Let's see. Bioidenticals do not have to come from a compounding pharmacy. Whoever is telling you that is wrong, okay? The estradiol patch that I use from Walgreens and cost me $25 on the for $10 on my copay is bioidentical. Don't, y'all, they're selling you a bunch of shit. 
<laughs> um, be careful. You are a vulnerable population and there are people coming after you. There are, this is a menopause gold rush. Everybody's getting into the menopause game. Look, I've been here forever and I make no money making these videos, okay? I'm just here to educate and tell you what I tell my patients, what I would give my, what I give my sister. I'm her, I'm her menopause specialist. So, um, so everybody take a break, hit my face like 10 times, 10 times. Please follow me if you don't follow me. It really helps me stay relevant on this platform. And let's see, I'm reading the questions, hang on. Let's see, how just got here, Primarin cream. Uh, it's not my favorite. I don't like Primarin. Um, Primarin is made from pregnant mare urine, and I don't like what they do to the horses to get it. I just use plain estradiol cream uh, or the Vagisil, which is an estradiol tablet you can insert in the vagina. Those are my two kind of go-tos for vaginal estrogen. I kind of avoid Primarin um, because of how it's made, but that's a personal ethical thing for me. That doesn't mean it's a bad medicine. It just means I think they're a bad company. Uh, okay, let's see. You're on Jet, not losing weight, getting fatter. I don't know what Jet is, sweetie. Give me some more contacts. Where are you located? So my clinic is in Houston, outside of Houston. Um, I'm hiring a nurse practitioner uh, who I've worked with in my former life for 20 years. She is a fucking bomb. And... It's going to really open up things in the clinic. We have a backlog of 360 patients right now who are waiting to see me. So it's really going to help open things up. Yes, you can travel from out of state to come and see me. I cannot do a telemedicine visit. Um, so let's see. Um, you find my clinic at maryclairwellness.com. It's on our website at the link in bio. And then y'all, when you get off of this, go check out the link in bio. I have so many free resources. I have millions of blogs, not millions. I have a lot of blogs full of all of this information with links, with articles you can print out and take to your doctor with the ways to help you advocate for yourself at your OB-GYN's appointment. Um, let's see. I'm Tell me about the spray you use on your scalp for hair growth. Okay, y'all wanna talk about hair? All right, so yes, I lost a ton of hair through in perimenopause. That, I didn't, that was like a look back of, didn't realize that was happening. So, and it has, we're back. It's gray, but I got my hair back. Uh, it will never be my 25 year old hair, I realize that, but I now have hair again. So, um, I've been doing collagen, uh, that's probably has helped. So I definitely am more nutritionally robust than I ever was. So all my nutrition deficiencies have been fixed and that's thank you Galveston diet and the collagen, the collagen's on my website. You can go check it out, whatever. Um, and then the spray that I use is minoxidil generic. 5%. I get it from Amazon. Six bottles cost me $20, $25 and lasts me six months. Okay. I put it in a spray bottle. It comes with a dropper. I don't like the dropper. It drips on my face. So I put it in a cheap spray bottle. I just keep refilling it and spray at my root, rub it in and that's it. So I do that three times a week. Uh, massage it in, wash it out in the morning. That's it. Uh, I don't have to do it as often now. I'm probably only doing it once a week now. Like my hair is good. It's so good. So um, I would not take Primpro. I wouldn't do it. You have better options for your hormone replacement therapy. I would do a transdermal estradiol patch and an oral micronized progesterone for safety. Primpro is just as efficacious, meaning it's going to give you results just like the other, but it's this, these are safer. By the latest studies, estradiol and oral micronized progesterone seem to be the safest combination for an estrogen progestogen combo. Um, let's see. Uh, 
Okay, you're on testosterone and you have great levels and your libido is zero. Libido is complicated, guys. Libido is complicated. There are five buckets of sexual dysfunction women fall into and they can overlap. There's relationship disorders. There are orgasmic disorders. There are arousal disorders. There are desire disorders. And there's pain. So those are all treated very differently. Throwing the same medication at everyone who says I'm not happy with my sex life is not helpful, okay? This is an intense visit. And uh, so if your libido is not being helped, we need to explore, then you don't have a desire disorder, okay? Um, so by it, that's linked to testosterone. So we need to explore other options for you. Um, what is cyclical HRT? That sounds like something a um, someone made up. I would not do cyclical HRT, guys. That is a putting the fun and functional made up shit that somebody's trying to sell you their supplements or something. And I sell supplements, so, you know, whatever. But that's how I pay the bills here. Uh, but they're all evidence-based. You don't have to take them. It's fiber, it's omega-3, vitamin D, it's turmeric for menopause, you know, joint pain. And it's uh, the collagen that I totally did for vanity but also is helpful for osteoporosis as well. Um, let's see, I'm reading your questions. Non-generic estrogen patch or generic, which is better? I use generic, why pay more? They come out of the same factory, y'all, trust me. Uh, I don't believe in paying for things I don't have to when the results are the same. Okay, if you start estrogen, do you need progesterone if you have a Mirena IUD? No, remember, Progesterone initially is to protect the lining of the uterus from developing, let's see how pretty, from developing endometrial hyperplasia or cancer. So that's the initial purpose of progesterone. If you have a marine IUD, you don't need any extra progesterone for that. But progesterone can be helpful for sleep and for racing thoughts and anxiety, especially at night. So for when I have patients who have like had a hysterectomy or have the marina, and they're still struggling with those, I will do a trial and add in a little progesterone at night to see if it gets better. And for a lot of them, it does. Okay, um, so, oh, and please share this video. There's a share button down here. All this helps drive the algorithm and keeps me relevant on this profile. Um, what are the risks of ablation for heavy periods? Uh, well, the surgical complications are probably the biggest thing. Uh, so make sure that your healthcare provider knows how to do these procedures, that you're not the experiment on them trying some new newfangled machine, uh, that they've done a lot of them. Uh, God, make sure your OR team knows how to work the machinery. This is from coming from a surgeon. Um, then it might not work. You know, you may still have bleeding you're not happy with. You might have, and that's rare, you know, 93% of people after ablation are really happy, but you might still have periods. Um, that's really the biggest thing. It's pretty painful when you wake up. The uterus cramps real bad, so you need to make sure they're giving you adequate pain control uh, for the first, like, week or so. Um, but I'm a fan. You know, it's a outpatient, surgical, non-hormonal form of uh, controlling heavy periods, and my patients love them. So I don't do them anymore, but thoughts on functional medicine versus traditional doctors. This sounds like a loaded question. So you're asking a traditional doctor um, who has kind of in my menopause practice, I think I, I think that there's a place for functional medicine, but I would, I would caution not going to a chiropractor, you know, um, they can't prescribe medications. And so they're really going to lead you down a path of um, supplements and things that don't have a lot of evidence behind it. So I do think there's a place for it, but I'm not giving the green light for every, you know, a lot of people call themselves functional practitioners. So I would just do your, do your due diligence and do your homework. You know, traditional doctors have some great stuff about them. They're evidence-based, you know. That evidence doesn't work for everyone. I totally get that. And so, you know, my kind of, but I do a lot more than a traditional doctor. I do, you know, 
sleep counseling. We talk about stress reduction. You know, we do, I, I, in that approach, I'm more of a functional physician. Um, but I'm not going to leave evidence at the bedside just to make money. You know, I, I just really caution. And at least the ones I see on social media, all these who are calling themselves functional practitioners are not medical doctors. They are chiropractors who recognize there's a pain point for a lot of women and that you're not getting what you need, you're not getting listened to, you're being gaslit, so they're offering that, they're listening to you, you're feeling heard, but what they're offering for treatment often ends up putting you in a trap where you're spending hundreds if not thousands of dollars a month and you're not really getting better or healthier. So, you know, that's, that's my personal opinion. There's some great chiropractors out there. I go to one. She's fucking amazing. And, you know, but I go to her for spine health. Uh, I go to her for the world's best massages and for TENS treatments on some of my musculoskeletal issues. Um, I'm not going to her for menopause. That's not her. It's outside of her scope of practice. That's not why she's here. I don't do spine care. I don't try to adjust people's spines or do massages. I didn't, I didn't train in that. That's not my, you know, I didn't go to a weekend course and now I'm a menopause expert. Expert. I spent four years in, school, in medical school, four years in residency, and thousands and thousands of hours of self-study um, to be in menopause care. So, yeah. Sorry, the son got the phone. Um, okay. I'm reading the questions. Put your questions in the comments, guys. Let's see. Hang on. You're a gem. I wish more doctors like you. So many obese seem clueless. I'm grasping for straws. And you know what? It's not their fault. I'm a former residency program director. I taught residents off and on for 18 years. And I was in charge of their education. I was in charge of the curriculum as an associate program director. So I know the information we put forth for menopause is sorely lacking. And now as a menopausal woman, it's ridiculous. We spend more than 50% on obstetrics on just, you know, which is important. And then menopause gets into a little tiny slice of the pie for gynecology. And most of your time in gynecology is spent learning how to do surgery and get people pregnant and take care of ectopics. And, you know, the amount of time we spend on menopause, that there's a no menopause like clinic that most residents go to there's no there's maybe an hour lecture I'm not, I'm not kidding so we're um, we're fighting to change that through the menopause mandate I'm part of a political action committee where we're working to you know on a on a government level and then for you know really putting pressure on these American College of ob and the American Board of ob to really do more for menopause education for our residents so, anyway, uh, uh, I can't see the questions anymore, guys. The sun's too bright. Oh, yeah, we'll get on the path. Okay, hang on. So, uh, everybody take a second. Give me some hearts. Give me some love. Tap that screen like this. Boom, 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 boom. Um, that drives the algorithm. Keeps me relevant on this platform. So, my husband's on a conference call in front of me, so I said, well, I'll just go live on TikTok. Okay. Let's see. Uh, menopause and weight gain. Hi. You must be new here. That's how I started on my menopause education journey, was what the hell is this inner tube doing around my waist when I hadn't really done anything different? So, I have a whole program devoted to body composition changes, intra-abdominal visceral fat, health, nutrition, and menopause, called the Galveston Diet. Don't let the word diet fool you. It's a wellness plan. Um, I made it for my patients. In menopause, I mean, in medicine, diet is a pattern of eating. It's not like a fad. And so I named it, you know, it was something I was prescribing to my patients and then started sharing it on social media and the whole thing exploded and then the book came. So you can learn all about it, my link in bio. The book is on sale at Amazon, actually. Um, or you can get it anywhere you buy books. We have an, if you want to hear me talk about it, we have the online course, which I actually teach the lectures throughout the whole program. 
we have a lot of menopause information. We have a lot of like having you understand hormones and how they're affecting your body at this age. So go and check it out. And we have a coaching. If you need someone to hold your hand through the program, we have our platinum coaching program, which is pretty awesome. Um, so yeah, let's see. 48 had a period twice a month. So periods and perimenopause and menopause. Nothing is off limits. Too many, too few, too soon, too late, too heavy, too light, all of it. All of it is possible from the hormone fluctuations that are, it's a tsunami of hormone changes beginning in perimenopause. And then that wave hits and then the whole thing flattens out and then it's done. And the pool is empty. It's craziness. So, I mean, it used to look like a wave pool every month, choo, 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 right? And then all of a sudden the waves get a little bigger, they get further spaced out, then you don't know when they're coming, and then two waves come, and then, and then, then this giant fucking tsunami hits, and then the pool's empty, and you're laying on the bottom of the pool wanting to die. So, anyway. I am going to wrap this up because we're in town and it looks a little weird, me talking on my phone. Uh, anyway, love you guys. Thank you for listening. Hopefully you learned something today that allow you to be a healthier menopausal woman. Please check us out at our website at galvestondiet.com or I'll the link in our bio. We have quizzes. We got all kinds of stuff for you, all for free. Okay, guys? I want you to be your healthiest menopause rocking your menopause life like I am right now. Most of the time. Except I pulled a pinched a nerve in my neck. <laughs> Yesterday, a bug flew in my head, in my hat, in my glasses, and I was jumping up and down, and I heard snap. And I knew it. I had pinched a nerve in one of my cervical vertebrae. And by 5 o'clock, I couldn't turn my head, and my pain was horrible from this goddamn bug. I used to go through life and not pinch nerves in my neck. <laughs> 